Hi, I'm Sherry Gleed. I'm Dean of NYU Wagner, um, the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. And I am really delighted to be here um, and delighted to be partnering with our friends at the Citizens Budget Committee Commission um, for this, our next event in our NYC 2025 Road to Recovery series. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, our mission at Wagner is to prepare public service leaders to translate ideas into actions that have an effective and lasting impact on the public good. And our NYC 2025 project is an endeavor to, to actually do exactly that. We've convened nonpartisan experts across a range of areas to hold an ongoing conversation about issues that need to be addressed for the city to become stronger and more equitable than it was before COVID-19. Next week, Mayor Eric Adams will release his first budget as New York City's 110th mayor. And today our panelists will be discussing the upcoming budget with topics ranging from what the new administration can do to continue to support and encourage small businesses, responsibly manage the budget and spending and improve the administration and fairness of the property tax. Please meet our panelists, Greg Bishop, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services, welcome. Andrew Ryan, president of the Citizens Budget Commission and Martha Stark, clinical professor at NYU Wagner and NYC 2025 project leader. Our other NYC 2025 project leader, NYU professor Thad Calabrese will be our moderator. We look forward to, to today's conversation as it helps to further New York City on the road to recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so um, just to give uh, our, our, uh, our audience a sense of, of, of where we're, we're going today, um, as Sherry mentioned, this this panel, uh, which is one in a series of, of conversations we've had, um, is focusing on uh, the economy, uh, the budget, small business uh, topics of the uh, around the economic recovery of of New York City, and the reason we wanted to do this panel was because. Um, because of the the really the terrible toll that the the pandemic uh, had on the city's economy and especially on small businesses, uh, some estimates put small business closures at nearly half of establishments, with revenues for survivors down uh, by some estimates uh, nearly sixty percent. Uh, while parts of the nation have recovered lost jobs, New York City's unemployment rate remains stubbornly high and above the nation's average. So what can New York City do to encourage business, business growth and development and make sure no New Yorker is left behind? Um, today's panelists to discuss the issues are, are uh, as Sherry introduced, Andrew Ryan, president of the Citizens Budget Commission, Greg Bishop, currently the executive director of the Social Justice Fund and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services, and my esteemed colleague, uh, Martha Stark, professor at the Wagner School and former commissioner of the of, of the New York uh, City Department of Finance. Uh, if attendees have questions, uh, you can type them uh, into the chat. We'll, we'll address them after our panelists talk. And uh, the, the, the plan, just so uh, people are aware, um, we're planning to have our panelists talk for about 10 minutes each. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll then transition to each one right after another, which will then give us time for our conversation afterwards. We're hoping to, to close this uh, by, by around 11 o'clock. Um, so we, we should have ample time for, for discussion. So we're gonna start this off with um, comments from Andrew Ryan, president of the Citizens Budget Commission, uh, a 90 year old nonpartisan nonprofit think tank and watchdog focused on improving the finances, policies and operations of New York City and New York State government. Andy is a veteran of city and federal government, having been associate director of the CDC and executive deputy commissioner of the New York City Health Department, as well as a leader in nonprofit health organizations, having been senior vice president for strategy of both Emblem Health and NYU Lutheran. Welcome, Andy. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad you stuck in the NYU so I could have a little cred here. Um, and it's a pleasure, first of all, to be here with you and with Sherry. Um, both former colleagues of mine, I confess, and, and uh, benefit for that, and my, Martha, who I've known forever, and, and Greg, who's a new friend. Um, so um, I'm glad to be here um, with my panel from Brooklyn. So as that said, this is a really important time, and I'm here to talk a little bit just about the importance at this time of getting the basics right when running the city. I mean, it sounds simple, but it's sadly rare. 
this is a special time for New York. I think that already talked a little about it, about it. But you know what we need to do right now is preserve our historic assets, comparative advantage. People love living here, and so we need to ensure the vibrancy, safety, opportunity in New York City, and the benefits of being together. We need to deal with our current circumstances with the sluggish recovery. Only half the jobs have come back so far, and. New York City, especially, you know, certain parts of our central business district have been hit with the double whammy of loss of commuters and tourists. We also need to be planning for uncertainty. There is economic change afoot, as we know, with remote work. What does that do to our office space, our office, our, our um, property values, retail, our service economy and transit funding? Um, and uncertainty, just to portend a, a little ahead, uncertainty means we should get the basics right for whatever eventuality is. And then we need to address our long run challenges, housing affordability, the quality and efficiency of public services, our competitiveness. There are a lot of good places to live and we have to compete for those businesses. And we want people to stay here. We want people to come here. Um, and also quite frankly, the recent political logjam, although slightly broken recently in some land use decisions that have stopped us from taking actions that would create more housing, create more jobs, both of which we need. So everyone kind of agrees we need to improve our quality of life, bring back jobs and tourism, and improve equity while we do this. Um, the challenge is we also need to focus on the long run, because not only do we need to do these things today, but we need to be in a good position to protect our most vulnerable tomorrow and be competitive tomorrow. Um, but politics and popularity often run counter to that because people love shiny new toys and they love quick wins. And as the new administration comes in, it will show its progress and want to do that, but it needs to be thinking about the long run also. So as I outline all these, that's where um, Anna Champany and I, who came together to write this paper with this great NYU 2025 effort, thought about what is the Venn diagram here? It is actually the basics that keep New York safe, clean, affordable, customer service friendly, and customer. Just I'll pause for a second. Residents, tourists and, and businesses are all customers of our government. We have to be customer service friendly and we have to have the ecosystem that creates opportunity because that's what New York's always been about, a place for opportunity and to be healthy. Um, we identified a basic set of fiscal, managerial and policy priorities that I'll, I'll review probably at a pretty high level now, but in discussion, we can delve into whatever. So let's talk about the fiscal context as Sherry said, next Wednesday, Mayor Adams will um, will release his first preliminary budget, which is really a blueprint of what he's going to do because there ain't money there. You ain't doing a lot of this stuff, but there's also policy bound up and not all is budgetary, but this is a really important um, window into the future of this administration. The context is budget gaps for the next few years, 3 billion, not, not the worst, but we have to realize that baked into that budget are what we've called city and federal, federal fiscal cliffs, meaning one-time money, it ain't gonna keep coming. That's funding recurring programs like 3K and like the um, housing voucher increase that um, happened this year. That money is not in the budget in the, in the long run. So we have to deal with those federal and city fiscal cliffs. And we're gonna negotiate, the city has to negotiate with um, the unions as contracts, some expired, some will come expired. Those monies for the raises are not in the budget as well. So there is that fiscal context. And there are three priorities that we think the city should um, address and focus on. One is use that federal money wisely. About 13 billion of education funding and flexible funding, some of which has already been spent, but there's still a lot that the Adams administration can use wisely, first of all, to not fund recurring programs because then we, we have to get rid of that clip, but also be more strategic than the original proposed allocation, which sprinkled a lot of money in a lot of places, which might sound good for all those places, but won't really have the impact. The second is to reduce our workforce and spending levels to sustainable levels. Now our workforce um, came down during the pandemic. I don't know that it has to come down anymore, but we shouldn't go on a hiring spree right now. And the mayor has proposed programs to eliminate the gap, 3% savings from all the agencies. You know, I oversaw finance in an agency for um, eight years. I believe totally doable without reducing services. So kind of the right target, but he also should be looking at central services like fleet management and space management as well as working with labor to um, normalize our benefits, which are much more generous in some ways than state benefits. And obviously this is a challenge, comes out of people's pockets, we acknowledge that. But if city employees contributed to health insurance even less than state employees, it would reduce city spending by 750 million under one, one scenario. So bring those spending levels to achieve um, 
um, affordable, recurring affordable levels. And the purpose is, this is not about austerity budgeting. We certainly actually spend more than most places and more than we have historically. This is about preserving our ability to um, take care of our most vulnerable in the future. And the other way to do that, the third priority is to grow the city's rainy day fund. In the actual rainy day fund itself, there's less than, uh, you know, less than a billion dollars in it. There's another four billion in another fund, but we should have 11 billion running into that next um, recession. And we have a recession every roughly since the seventies, every six and a half years. Right now we have a billion when we should have 11. We need to protect ourselves because we can't count on the federal government coming in with the biggest bailout package ever in the history for state and local governments once again. Be nice if it happened, but we have to plan for our own future. Management wise, management matters. So you get the budget, you have it sustainable, good. But if you, you need to produce quality services that are efficient and effective for people, and that's where management comes in. The first, so five priorities there. First, pro Prioritize your priorities. Prioritize services that really matter. You love, the city loves to do everything for everyone, but it needs to do the core basics right. Education, public safety, sanitation, public health, and transportation. Within those, there are certain priorities outside of those some, but really needs to get those basics right. The second is, again, as I talked about efficiency before and savings, as the mayor's talked about, run each of these services. And CBC's done a lot of work on individual services where there's ways to run them more efficiently and effectively. The third is to relentlessly manage that performance. We've heard for generations now about CompStat and the police department. I started a quarterly program review at the health department. We need a citywide performance management system. Cascading from the mayor to the commissioner, to the deputy mayors, to the commissioners, to the um, bureau heads, down to the frontline managers that has both the right data, not just counting widgets, but outcomes, quality, and efficiency of these operations, and has and also has the right process where these people sit together and, and hold each other accountable and fix things that aren't working and expand things that are. Fourth is make some of those data publicly available, public accountability. Um, demands it, the people deserve to know where their money is going and what's happening with it. And right now we produce a decent amount of data in the city, but still a lot of widget counting and not about quality, efficiency, um, uh, uh, quality and, uh, and efficiency and outcomes. And the last is management. One of the managerial tasks is to work with labor to effectuate change. As I mentioned, those collective bargaining agreements. If, if we improve our work rules, improve what job titles can be expanded in doing and work with labor to be more efficient, we can do three things. Reduce our costs, um, provide career paths for city employees, because it shouldn't just be about security. We're a city of opportunity. City employment should not just be about security, but growth and opportunity within the city and outside the city. So we can improve that. And finally, we can find those efficiencies that can self-fund the raises that we'd like to give city employees. Because right now, as I said, they're not in the budget. The money's got to come from somewhere. Let's not. Um, let's figure out how to give people raises they deserve. Finally, two policy areas that we think are particularly important when it comes to the basics, improving housing availability and affordability, and focusing effectively on creating jobs. On housing production, um, my colleague Sean Campion did a great report showing that we lag other regions in housing production. Part of our affordability problems is we're not developing enough housing. So we need to plan for growth, zone for growth, make changes at the city and state level that reduce our, our costs. We need to fix the property tax system, but Martha's the expert, so I'll leave it to her. Um, and that will help our housing affordability. We all And we also need to support NYCHA. There are ways to improve NYCHA's access to capital, the NYCHA housing trust that can Produce, pr preserve public ownership, protect tenants, and bring in capital and other proposals at the state to reduce NYCHA's cost. Um, I will also say the governor proposed a, a package of housing production um, 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 policy changes with Florida area ratio, transit oriented development, ADUs, a good package that will also help the city. And finally, let's get EDC back in the game of economic development and not spend most of their discretionary money subsidizing ferries. Um, nice ride. Um, and maybe there's some commutation, but we subsidize ferries almost $10 a ride, some of them $20 a ride. There should be variable fares on those ferries. If a tourist or my daughter wants to go to the beach in the summer, I'm not sure why I should pay an extra 20 bucks in taxes so that um, she can go to the beach when she could uh, get there another way. So we need the 
EDC to focus on, on rationalizing its benefits as of right benefits, um, evolving them in the modern era of what we need and not focusing on ferries. So I will leave it there at that. I know that was a lot to cover. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate that. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Greg Bishop. Uh, Greg made a name for himself investing in low to moderate income communities, growing the capacity of small and medium sized enterprises, implementing sectoral workforce strategies and building resilient technology infrastructure for media companies. Um, he's the former commissioner of small business services for the city, and he is currently the executive executive director of the social justice fund an initiative funded by the Joe and Clara Sai Foundation. The Social Justice Fund centers its work around racial justice and economic mo mobility for BIPOC populations in Brooklyn. Uh, Greg grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and like myself, is a huge Seinfeld fan. Thanks, <laughs> I just Greg. had to throw that in there, Thad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. And, Ed, and Andy, uh, what, what a great uh, just meetup. Um, I think uh, a number of great points, um, which uh, I totally agree with. Um, you know, one of the things I'd love to, to talk about is how small businesses fit into that ecosystem, um, because one of the things that I think people don't realize is how important, I mean, we say it all the time that small business are the economic engine uh, of the city and the country, but truly small businesses are the economic engine of New York City. Um, and I think as we talk about our finances, especially our city finances, uh, we cannot have that conversation without talking about how do we support our small businesses. Uh, New York City has over 220,000 small businesses. And prior to the pandemic, over 98% of them had fewer than 100, uh, 100 employees. Um, and 89% of them had fewer than 20 employees. It's stark when you start looking at uh, just the demographics of those small businesses, uh, because even in New York City, um, we have about 3.5% of those uh, businesses are black owned. Um, and we know based on the fact that businesses, these small businesses are employers, um, that if we do not have a sort of equity in our small business ecosystem, then we're going to have workforce issues in our different neighborhoods. Um, most small businesses, and you know, when I was commissioner, we did a, a study and we saw that uh, those small businesses, those micro businesses actually employ almost half the city's workforce. Um, and, and that is important because when we talk about uh, mobility, when we talk about uh, things that we need to do to support our neighborhoods, um, when we talk about crime, when we talk about health services, when we talk about uh, access to different uh, services, we, we need to talk about wages and we need to talk about employment. Um, and it is these small businesses that the, the, the actual answer to, to that puzzle. Um, and so we know that small businesses have challenges and, and we've talked about them. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the Adams administration definitely have had a number of conversations with previous commissioners, including myself, uh, you know, Mary Tora Springer, who's the deputy mayor of economic uh, development and workforce uh, was the previous commissioner at SBS, also president of EDC. So she's well aware of some of these challenges. Um, and I was very pleased to see that one of the first things that the Adams administration did was talk about our regulatory environment. It, it truly is a challenge for small businesses. And as I talked about the fact that these small businesses are, are micro businesses, where you have maybe you know less than 10 employees, you do not have the sophistication that's necessary to navigate the regulatory, the complex regulatory environment of New York City. But we are a city of 8.4 million people, so we do need our agencies to protect us uh, from building collapses and you know, food poisoning issues, et cetera. However, there is a way we can do it without penalizing our small businesses. And I'm pleased, I was very happy to see uh, the mayor challenge agencies to come back with a proposal in terms of how we can move from just finding businesses uh, to actually teaching businesses. Now, Andy, you may understand this. Uh, a lot of the, uh, when you talk about alternative source of revenue, uh, unfortunately, a lot of agencies turn to small businesses as alternative source of revenues uh, to fund uh, those raises that you're talking about. And so we have to get out of that, that mindset of using our small businesses as a cash cow uh, to support uh, government initiatives. We need to find other sources of revenue. And once we do that, then we can move to 
similar to like what the USGA does. Uh, if they come into a business and they find a, 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 a violation, they teach that business. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to fix it. And we'll be back, but make sure it's fixed. And if they come back and it's not fixed, that's when we start doing the, the penalties. Now, of course, we don't want to do that if it's life or safety issues. Uh, but I think there's a number of violations that the city has that we could certainly uh, move to that model. Uh, for those who don't know, there's over 6,000 violations uh, all across the city. Uh, I'm sorry, regulations for all across the city. Um, and if you're a small business, especially if you're in the restaurant industry or if you're in a complex industry that requires navigating a number of different agencies, uh, you have to know what you don't know. Um, and I think that is one of the things that we have struggled with as a city is how do we teach our business owners what they don't know? I think the other challenge is actually, you know, in the private sector, dealing with landlords. Um, and I know, you know, Commissioner Stark is going to talk about the property tax system, but we have small businesses, um, individuals who find the right location, the perfect location, and they just sign a lease. Uh, they don't realize it's a triple net lease. And as the income tax, uh, as the property tax goes up on that property, uh, it's passed directly. That cost is passed directly onto that business owner. Um, I think, and, and I, I don't want to get too deep into this because I know Commissioner Stark is going to talk about this, but most of our multi-use uh, buildings, uh, these are not your single family homes, but our multi-use buildings uh, that has residential commercial are, are, are bearing the largest property tax burden. And that's where most of our small businesses are located. Uh, so we need to figure out a way to, to balance that. I think every single mayor has avoided it because it's been kryptonite in terms of their efforts to be reelected, uh, because what we're really talking about is possibly raising property taxes on single family homes. Um, and they are the ones that go out and vote. Um, so there is a lot of politics there. I understand that, uh, which is why, you know, I could say that now because I'm not in government anymore, that we need to do something. Um, just make sure you don't raise the taxes on my mom's house. She'll be very upset about that. <laughs> But the other area we also need to do is, you know, help business owners understand how to be more, uh, you know, help them navigate uh, the leasing area, maybe provide them. And we had a great program in terms of provide them with attorneys, uh, but it's just helping them understand the true cost of the lease. Uh, I think we have bottles, uh, for example, when you are taking out a mortgage, uh, there's a true cost of the mortgage uh, based on the percentage and based on the potential increases, et cetera. Uh, so we need to build, build more transparency in the leasing uh, uh, industry uh, and uh, commercial landlords. Uh, small businesses also have to deal with uh, workforce. And we saw this with the pandemic. Uh, the hospitality industry is still reeling uh, because we have what, what I call the great, well, everyone's calling the great resignation. Uh, individuals realizing that they probably can make more either through the gig economy uh, or elsewhere. And so uh, how do we help these small businesses figure out, uh, do, we, do I pay more uh, in terms of salary? Uh, you know, where do, I, where do I absorb the increase in, in, in expenses? Um, you know, workforce will be a challenge for our small businesses and we need to figure out a way to either help our small businesses handle additional training or uh, you know, figure out a way to, that these small businesses understand how to actually attract new employees. And then finally, just in terms of challenges, technology. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, when I was the commissioner uh, prior to pandemic, we were we were facing a very very steep uh, hill in terms of individuals just turning uh, to the online services, uh, whether it's Amazon or whether it's you know Walmart or wherever. Um, and the pandemic, unfortunately, has exacerbated that. You know, my mom is 72 years old and figured out Instacart, um, and, and so. These are the things where if you're a small business in a neighborhood and you don't have a proper web presence, you don't have an e-commerce presence, you don't know how to be visible online, you're going to be in trouble. Um, so how do we help as a city uh, these small businesses uh, get that competitive advantage? Uh, so what I think the Adams administration needs to look at is, number one, access to capital, right? Because everything I talked about it requires capital. Uh, so how do we make it easier for small businesses? The work that I'm doing with the Social Fund, you know, we are challenging the notion of uh, risk. Uh, so we created a loan for, for Black-owned businesses uh, that's simply based on viability, whether you made money or broke even, and a character reference. We're not asking for collateral. We're not asking for a guarantor because, again, collateral guarantors exacerbate some of the structural racism that Black-owned businesses face. Uh, because of the lack, because of redlining, 
uh, the lack of having, uh, you know, property, therefore the lack of having equity that they could take and actually uh, invest in a business. Um, so we have to be uh, very specific in terms of uh, our inter in interventions uh, to address some of these systemic issues. Uh, you know, we did a study uh, uh, when I was commissioner, uh, a commissioner study for black owned businesses. Uh, the, the report is on SBS's website. Um, and we heard uh, from these business owners access to capital, uh, networking, just finding each other. You know, they don't have like the network uh, necessary to make the connections and, of course, necessary to get those investors. Affordable space, uh, you know, this goes hand in hand with uh, just, you know, what I talked about with the leasing. Uh, affordable space uh, is a challenge, and that might lead into, you know, property tax reform, right? Because some of these landlords are holding on to their rent because uh, they need that income to pay their property tax. But I will also throw in our commercial banks. You know, when a property goes through uh, either a refinance of a mortgage or a new mortgage, uh, the banks are actually telling the property that uh, the uh, mortgage are, I, you need to have this type of business in your space. Otherwise, we're not going to approve this mortgage. Uh, so therefore, if a small business that doesn't have the credit necessary uh, to meet that mortgage demand uh, looks at that space, that landlord is cannot rent to that, that small business. Instead, they need to find you know, uh, one of the chains, et cetera, et cetera. So our banks, uh, when they actually make these mortgages, are adding to the problem of vacant space or, or, or spaces that are not affordable. Uh, for our small businesses. Uh, we also need to focus on technical assistance. And I know some folks are, might roll their eyes when they say, when we're talking about small businesses and we're talking about minority business, we also talk about technical assistance. Um, but there is a need for culturally competent technical assistance. Uh, I think between small business services and EDC, there's a way that we can actually address that uh, where it's not you know, one size fit all. Uh, in some cases, all a business needs is just help in terms of finding the next uh, venture capitalist, right? They don't need to know how to actually, you know, do uh, their books and QuickBooks because they already, they're beyond that, right? They just need one part of it. So figure out a way to really customize technical assistance. And then, you know, and I'm going to wrap up with two more things. One, procurement. You know, the city spends anywhere between 15 and $20 billion a year. That's with a B. Um, and certainly we have moved the needle on the MW program. I think when I left, we were almost at 30%. And I give a lot of credit uh, to the previous administration, Mayor de Blasio, in terms of being aggressive uh, in terms of uh, accountability. But I also want to challenge the Adams administration in terms of not only uh, you know, keeping that aggressive accountability for the agencies to help them figure out how to use more smaller minority-owned businesses, uh, but we as a city have an issue in terms of our payment uh, procedures, and I'm going to bring in the controller as part of this. The previous controller did not uh, participate in uh, in advancing uh, using technology to make the procurement process faster. Um, so this controller has the ability, um, you know, to make that easier and faster. So we don't need to, we don't have to, businesses don't have to wait 30, 60 days for a contract to get registered. These contracts need to be registered faster so payments can start flowing faster. A small, you know, when I talk about these small businesses, you know, the ones that want to do business with the city, they do not have the balance sheet to float uh, a, a contract for 60, 90, even sometimes 180 days. So we need to do a much better job in paying our businesses faster. And then finally, our workforce. Uh, we need to help our workforce, um, you know, certainly with additional training. Uh, we need to focus on sectors that are fast growing, uh, but we also need to not forget uh, the businesses that make up the fabric of a neighborhood, whether it's your barbershops, whether it's your hair salons, whether it's your cleaner, your dry cleaners, uh, we need to make sure that we help them figure out a way to find talent um, as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible. Uh, and certainly between the Economic Development Corporation, between Small Business Services, and even Human Resources Administration, uh, there are the tools that's there. Um, and I certainly have confidence that under the leadership of Maria Tor Springer, uh, we'll be able to, the Adams administration will be able to figure this out. Uh, but the, here, that's the sort of the landscape that we're working with uh, within a small business ecosystem. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so next we're going to uh, hear from, from my colleague, Martha Stark. 
Uh, Martha is a recognized expert on New York City's property tax system and served as the city's uh, finance commissioner before, act, uh, before entering academia full time. And, and like Greg, Martha is also a native Brooklynite. Um, so Martha, would you like to walk us through the always popular property tax reform issues? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you, um, Thad, and uh, thank you, Andy and Greg. And, and you may have caught this earlier because Andy said this was an all Brooklyn panel. Um, he's, he's absolutely right. We're kind of an all Brooklyn panel. Don't know exactly how that happened, but um, you know, what, what can I say? Um, and, you know, Greg failed to mention in his, his, you know, bio is he's a Brooklyn Tech graduate as am I. So um, he graduated way before I did. No, just joking. It's probably the reverse. Um, so I want to want to thank you um, for all of that. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, Andy highlighted um, what we should look for and think about in terms of the upcoming um, budget. And he talked about getting the basics right. And I, I love that theme of getting the basics um, kind of right. Um, Greg pointed out the sort of various ways in which um, what we do as a city um, affects a really important sector, um, small businesses. And, and you know, quite articulately talked about the kinds of things that we can do to make it easier for small businesses to operate here um, in, the, in the city. So in my 10 minutes, I actually um, wanna highlight sort of three um, quick themes from my soon to be released and much too long paper on property taxes and what can be um, done. Just wanna, um, even the, the title of the paper is a bit of a mouthful, but I think it's um, important to sort of um, hear it. So I call this paper, um, the property tax, what the city should do now, and I emphasize the word now, to actually make the property tax fair, um, more fair, easier to understand, and more predictable. And I say that they can do that even before there's a court mandated um, action um, or any legislative overhaul. In fact, I identify 20 things that can be done now. And um, you know, every day when I shower, my brain comes up with two more. So if you, you know, wanted, I could literally come up with, you know, 20 additional ideas. And a lot of them fall in the realm of what Andy talked about from a managerial perspective in terms of thinking about both performance um, outcomes but more importantly, quality control measures as well. So just by way of background, I wanted to say in 2017, Tax Equity Now New York filed a lawsuit against New York City and New York State. And I um, am, uh, you know, in addition to my teaching, I do some policy um, work and was the policy director um, for Tax Equity Now New York and continue in that role. So we challenged the property tax um, on state and federal constitutional grounds. And because we believe the system violates the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, the status of it right now is we're actually awaiting a determination from the Court of Appeals um, as to whether or not they're gonna allow us to appeal an a uh, negative appellate division decision that was um, uh, made. And so we're hoping to hear from the Court of Appeals um, shortly. The second thing that I wanted to sort of by way of background point out is a few days before the end of their terms, Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Corey Johnson issued a very long awaited report from its property tax reform commission. Um, and I want to note that the group of people on that commission are incredible and awesome. And um, the report um, has a lot of fantastic data and um, some recommendations but I will highlight that none of those recommendations can be implemented without incredibly complex state legislation. And, you know, Greg jokingly said actually before, you know, it's clear some taxes have to be raised, but not my mother's taxes because she would be very upset with me. And so, you know, um, uh, the sort of fun part of, of me actually 
um, created a poll because I was on the webinar a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually issue the poll and continue to talk while this is um, going on. So I'm gonna launch this poll um, uh, for those of you and you know, you know, feel free to you know, kind of complete it as, um, uh, sort of as things go. I think um, several of you can see this poll now. So I believe the property tax is vital to the city's economy. Not only does it um, constitute a substantial share of our tax revenue, I'm going to make the argument that everyone, everyone pays it. Um, renters, tenants, you pay um, the property tax. And we, we, the court actually, I think, is an incredibly important um, part of um, the piece of the puzzle in terms of thinking about the property tax, but we cannot wait. Um, and I think we must do things now. And so the categories of things that I've come up with in my sort of paper are all around how to make this tax believable again, where people have a sense that it is fair, um, that we actually think about the folks who are paying the property tax as customers, again, as Andy so, um, so eloquently um, sort of described. And I'm going to talk about the categories in basically um, sort of three broad um, areas. And I'll start with my old agency that I still um, today, to this day love and think is the best job um, in the world and I'm pleased to have Preston E. Black uh, serve as the commissioner there. So the Department of Finance, as you know, is responsible for valuing property in the city of New York. And they do it on an annual um, basis. Um, every single year, the assessors are out kind of valuing one plus, um, one, more than 1 million um, properties. And they do value properties, even if those properties are um, completely um, exempt. Um, and so they're issuing um, these um, assessments. And 18 days into um, Mayor Adams's term, they released their tentative assessment role. Um, and in it, um, their market values and assessed values. And what I will say is, and the paper tries to kind of walk you through the various ways in which they determine market values. Some of it is um, certainly um, uh, based on state law and limited in its um, approach, but the city of New York and the Department of Finance especially needs to do a better job from a quality control perspective of ensuring that there's some consistency and easy explanations and how it is they've arrived at different values. And I would argue they're not doing that well at all. Um, and I'll start um, with, you know, sort of just from a market value perspective, I wanna talk about two kind of quick things. The one is um, how they value co-ops and condos. Um, and yes, makes no mistake about it. You must value co-ops and condos um, as if they are rental properties, which is a crazy, um, kind of crazy way to sort of think about um, valuing co-ops and condos. Um, I, I do tell the story of I, I um, sort of out of some misfortune was able to purchase my co-op in Park Slope um, for $90,000 in 1984. And it is worth more than that now. Um, uh, you know, how much more, you know, depends on um, when, I, when I'm talking about it. And if you were to look at my assessment right now and finance's estimate of market value, as a result of the way that it's done, my assessment, or I should say the estimate of market value might now be $110,000. 1984, I bought it for 90. It's now valued at 110. And it's worth more than that, I hope. Anyway, um, and so, they have a kind of clear you know, issue where they are identifying rental properties and they're trying to figure out what mine is worth. But what's interesting about that, and I'm not saying that they're, um, you know, that's not a, a difficult task, is there are two components that are incredibly important that the finance department can fix right now. One is sharing with um, building owners what comparables they're using and not adjusting those. So there's data out there that says, Martha, your building is assessed like this rental, but then within it, they're adjusting it, um, you know, nine zillion times. Um, and 
it doesn't then clearly translate to me being able to figure out what's, um, what's happening there. The second thing is from a quality control perspective, and I actually do talk about this in the paper, um, I just did a little run of like City Realty's 100 top condominiums in um, the city of New York and, and thought, well, what, what happens here if you look at the values that Department of Finance arrived at? And what you'll see is the top condominium in the city of New York or in Manhattan, no surprise, 220 Central Park South. You know, great um, sales in there. Everyone talks about Ken Griffin's $238 million property. Um, incredible. Well, 220 Central Park South does not have the highest market value in the city of New York for condominiums. Now, yes, they have to actually use rental properties to do that, but um, there's no reason why they can't look at sales just to make sure there's some relative, you know, sort of um, valuation compared to sort of sales price. You can't use sales price, but you can still sort of do that. And so when it comes to market value, many areas where um, the Department of Finance can do a better job of ensuring relative comparisons make um, a lot of sense. Um, the second thing that I you know, kind of want to um, highlight there when it comes to market value is um, actually vacant land. One of the things that makes housing production difficult is that land prices are really high. Um, well, the city of New York can actually value land using sales prices, but they do not. And so um, I, I will say that mayoral candidate um, Andrew Yang pointed this out um, during his um, time that vacant land is significantly undervalued. And one wonders whether or not if it had, um, you know, the kind of uh, better market value compared to sales price, um, if it could drive down some of, of um, the land prices, not significantly, but have an impact. So um, talk about that. And there's a number of other things that I, I want, want to um, uh, you know, say, and you'll see it um, in the paper when, when we um, release it. The second area that they do, so market value is the first thing that they're thinking about. The second thing is assessed value. And the rules are assessments have to be uniform within each tax class. That was part of the deal when this system was set up in 1981. And it was set up in 1981 um, by actually um, overturning a court decision and also um, overcoming um, a, um, a gubernatorial veto. So this current system that we have was vetoed by then um, Mayor um, um, Governor Carey um, and they um, overcame it. And the, the sin qua non of it was you have to be uniform within each tax class. Now, I have come to liken uniformity to my um, niece who's a type one diabetic managing her blood sugar levels. And what's interesting about that is that your blood sugar level is going to go up and down and there's a little band in which it's really kind of safe and where you should be. That is also true about uniformity. And you know, the, the language is around a coefficient of dispersion. You have to be within this band and the city of New York is not and has not been. And what it means is because of the way all of the rules um, um, exist, you have to lower the assessment ratio. You just have to, and it's not, it's not fun and people don't love it, but you have to do it. Um, and right now the assessment ratio that the city tells us is uniform, they say is 6%. And I say is three and a half percent. If you want the coefficient of dispersion to actually be within the acceptable amounts, it has to be lower to three and a half percent. And um, that would bring it um, within, which means lowering the assessment for people who are higher than that. And if you look around the city in places like Canarsie, um, in um, the Bronx, in Staten Island, um, people are paying at a much higher percent. And actually, even if you look at properties that end up in a lien sale, they tend to be at that higher percent. And it costs money to do that. So, you know, Andy might not like that part, but it costs money to lower it, um, but it's, it's something um, that should be done. Um, I, I, I do want to, in the last kind of, of my remarks, as I said, I have 20 kind of recommendations. I do wanna talk about the system for reviewing 
um, on property taxes, the tax commission, the law department, and the courts. Um, when we talk about the length of time, you know, we were talking about that, um, uh, Greg mentioned it in terms of procurement, the length of time that it takes for our property owners to get any relief when they prove that their case um, or their properties are overassessed is appallingly long. Um, you go to the tax commission, they are you know, trying to sort of um, um, do things, but the law department and the courts, it takes years. And part of that is because um, the city's goals to me are not aligned with trying to provide relief to homeowners in a way that actually um, gets them uh, some certainty about their taxes um, in, a, in a reasonable period of time. Um, and then I wanna end with the city council um, because I was meeting with someone recently who said, I, I, wanna, I wanna know what we can do on property taxes. And if we um, cannot, I wanna absolve myself of responsibility and be able to say, we've done everything we can. And a Catholic in me, of course, you know, um, felt really strongly about um, absolution. And so I want to, in no uncertain terms, say that the city council cannot absolve itself in any way, shape, and form about what it can do on the property taxes because it has not done all that it can. And the one thing that I would um, uh, suggest is that the council um, adopt um, what many other places have, um, a sort of truth in taxation um, sort of idea and just to tie this to the budget we're going to see next week when the budget is released that there is going to be um, expected growth in property tax revenues and that growth is going to mimic how much assessments have grown and that is absolutely the wrong way for the city to decide how much revenue it gets from the property tax Everywhere else in the state, actually, how much revenue each year you raise from the property tax is limited to 2%, um, and that's the maximum growth that you can, um, can get. That can be overturned, no question, by um, the legislative body, but the city of New York is not limiting itself to a 2% growth and not doing any truth in taxation. That's how I would describe it. Instead, what they do is council members will say, the property taxes went up because the assessors raised the property tax. Assessors are not property tax, they're not revenue raisers. They're supposed to set the base right, and then the mayor and the council decide how much money they want to raise. And so one small thing that they could do that will help them realize the power that they have on property taxes is to first say, what would the tax rates be if we didn't raise additional revenue from the property tax, what would it be if we did 2%? And then what would it be under this process that we've been using forever where assessment growth leads to revenue growth? And I would say that alone would highlight the very, very important role and decisions that they have to make around property tax revenues. Again, I have about um, 20 more things that I could tell you, but I'm gonna stop there and um, kind of turn, um, turn it over back to Thad so we can have kind of questions um, and answers in that, um, in that regard um, and hope that you all will um, read my paper and um, ask as many questions as you can. Thanks. Thanks, Martha. Um, so we, we do have some questions, so I'm going to try to um, direct them where they should go. Um, so we have questions in the chat, we have questions in the Q&A, those are, those are fine. Um, so let me, let me start off, so there was, there was a comment made, which I'm going to convert into a question, and I'm going to, I think, direct it um, towards, towards you, Andy. Um, it was it was that the that the EDC subsidizes ferries most definitely, but that the MTA also subsidizes, um, you know, pretty heavily express and commuter buses, um, you know, to to a to a fairly large extent. Now I, I know that that the MTA is not a city agency, so this this is not something that that you know Mayor Adams could address per se, um, but but you know. Assuming that's correct, um, is and the MTA has a massive structural deficit, and, and CBC has written extensively on that and and and, and provided some uh, 
potential solutions to that problem. But given that, is that are those subsidies something that perhaps the governor should be uh, addressing um, in in the near future, or are those subsidies justified for some reason of you know trying to encourage people to come back into the city? Um, well, and and. Let's let's step back on a, on a couple of things. First of all, I, I don't know the exact date on which rides are subsidized to the ex, um, extent. The fare box recovery ratio is between 40 and 50%, depending how you count it on, on the MTA, much, much, much lower on, on the ferries. But obviously the MTA, there are different services the MTA you know, provides. Um, and, and so I, I need to check on the express buses. I think one thing you need to think about is fare policy. Express buses, you know, many are, it's a kind of premium service, if you will. Um, people pay at times $6 for it versus a 275 subway fare. So part of what we're saying, a ferry fare, which is this tied to the subway. Um, part of what we're saying is there should be variable pricing on the ferries or different, different prices and think more about it like the express bus service, which would significantly reduce the subsidy that the, um, that, that the ferry receives. The second is um, we do need to think about transit accessibility and make those policy choices, um, both on how we provide accessibility to transit deserts and all those things pretty consciously and figure out a way to be most efficient on that. One of the things we can do on our surface buses, and I'm certainly blowing up global, is have you know increased bus speeds through um, various uh, techniques and, and road redesign and, and routes, that would actually increase, decrease our cost of running buses in, this, in the city, which would be a tremendous um, help, at, um, especially to the MTA's structural deficit. So I think what you need to do is fair policy, the efficiency of, of the service, and look at those together. And, and then, of course, the governor has a great role to play, um, not with, uh, notwithstanding the debate about the structure and the governor's role in the MTA has a great role to play, especially in working with labor and MTA management to increase the um, efficiency. And I will say, just last piece, is that the MTA's fare policy of regular um, biennial uh, fare increases, which it has decided to forego for the time being, um, is really smart policy and they should return to it because I certainly should pay 15 cents extra to get to work and get home. And then the city needs to promote and very heavily its fair fares policy for people who actually need help um, with their fares on the subway. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, so there's a, there was a, one of the, and I'm, I'm gonna be bouncing around in the questions for a little bit. We have time for a few questions. So one of the questions, and I was gonna actually ask a variant of this question, I guess this would go to, um, to both Martha and to Greg. Um, maybe we'll start with Martha, but, um, so, so to the extent that the property tax is, is fairly convoluted and no one seems to understand it except for Martha, um, you know, how does this impact small business? Um, you know, so is, you know, as, as, as Greg was talking about that there are, there are um, impacts of, of this system on small businesses. So, you know, is, can we discuss for a few minutes about how this confusion about the property tax impacts small businesses beyond um, you know, just that no one understands it? Um, so, so maybe we can, and then Greg, if you want to jump in after, that'd be. Yeah, I was actually going to um, suggest that, you know, Greg kind of set the framework for this um, earlier in his comments when he said um, he wanted to help people understand the true cost of their lease. Um, and how um, basically many um, leases, as he, he, he used, you know, lingo that, um, that, that we would also break down, um, result in the, um, the, the tenant paying not just rent, but paying all of the utility charges as well as the taxes on, on the property. And so um, I saw that question was actually going to respond in the um, Q&A. So I think there's a couple of things that um, uh, that uh, mayor can do both in the upcoming budget, but also um, sort of generally speaking. So I like Greg's idea of trying to sort of figure out um, maybe, you know, maybe it's just guidance on how to understand the true cost of a lease. And not only that, the fact that you have a lease that requires you to pay 
three times basically, is that that income gets um, used by the Department of Finance when they value the property. So because it's, it's sort of to the owner, they're getting actually more sort of rent. So what can um, one do in terms of that? One, I do think some of this is around education, but from my, from my perspective, I also think there's a, um, a quality control portion of this that I actually want to see the public advocate involved in, all of the borough presidents involved in, where they actually understand how the taxes, you know, again, I, I think of this in a relative way, um, because, um, you know, a, 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 do we think the most expensive strip in Brooklyn for retail, you know, just, you know, storefront retail, is that Brooklyn Heights? Is it Park Slope? Like having some relative idea of how we kind of think these pieces fit together, I think it's important for all of our elected officials to be on the same page in understanding what it means for small businesses to pay and have them understand relatively what it um, what their taxes mean. Some people um, use as a quality control indicator things like what are the taxes as a percent of gross income? Um, and some people will use in retail, what are the taxes as a percent of my gross sales? And using those quality control measures help people understand what they can plan for and expect um, in the future. Um, uh, so that's just one or two ideas about it. But then I turn to Greg who. Um, sure, I mean, I, I, uh, Martha, I think the, 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 I think we are all saying we need more transparency. Um, but cer certainly uh, the change uh, that you propose um, will take longer, but in the existing system, it's just bringing transparency. I cannot tell you how many business owners have, you know, came to me when I was commissioner saying, you know, one property is assessed, you know, one number and another property is assessed one number. I have no idea. You know, I have this increase in my taxes uh, because my landlord is passing this through. I can't even advocate for something because it's not my property. It's the landlord's property. And as long as I'm paying it, the landlord really doesn't care, right? Um, so I think having some ability um, and, and, you know, we probably go into more details. Uh, so I, I actually don't know uh, what finance has in terms of a business owner being able to advocate on their behalf uh, for any property tax adjustment because it's not their property, uh, but maybe strengthening that system uh, and ensuring that business owners have the ability uh, to ask for some type of relief. Uh, and then as simple as, you know, um, and I, I, and we mentioned everyone except council. I mean, council was very fixated on commercial rent control, uh, but let's figure out truth and transparency of leases, right? Um, you know, if you're extending a lease to a small business, you need to tell that business owner what stage you're in in your property tax increase, right? Every, every property owner knows because finance tells them that this is the stages that we're going to start increasing your property tax. That information is not always passed on to the business owner. So as a small business owner, remember, we're only talking about two or three people here. You know, when I do my projections, I'm not even, I'm assuming my lease is going to, my rent is going to stay the same amount. And that is probably true. But then the property tax increases hit me out of the blue. And then all of a sudden year three, I get this increase uh, from the landlord and it's a, it's a tax increase, not a lease increase. And, and so that is where a lot of small businesses stumble. And I think uh, some, some type of transparency resolution uh, or law uh, that council, uh, whether it's council or the public advocate or even the administration says, you know what, we're going to have a better uh, and, and easier way for our small business owners to understand all their expenses, I think can be done right now. All right, thank you. Um, we probably only have time for a quick one more question, so I apologize to our, our attendees who, who won't have their questions answered. Um, but we, we will be having more of these conversations over time. But so I'm gonna I'm gonna toss out this last question. Hopefully, um, uh, you whoever wants to field it. Um, so it's from an audience member it's, uh, that the city invests. Um, a lot for capital, um, and we have we do have an extremely large capital budget in New York City, um, but always seems to fall short on uh, operations and maintenance um, resources. Um, so, so these can clearly 
um, cause these assets to, to, to be used up a lot quicker um, if they're not maintained properly. Um, so, um, you know, what, what, can, what can the mayor, the city council, the current, you know, incoming uh, new group of folks uh, running the city, what can, what can they do to help overcome this? Um, obviously, putting more money towards maintenance would be would be one option. But um, you know, what else can be can be done to address this this real concern? I'll start out and then hand to my my colleagues. I, I mean, this is a you know, as I was the theme of my comments, getting back to basics. I think this is you know fits in that, which is. Shiny new toys are a lot more popular, whether it be you're an executive, a member of the executive or city council delivering to your constituency because deferred maintenance is something down the road. And then you can say, oh, I can't believe the subway's not running. I can't believe the school building's crumbling. I can't believe there's potholes in the road. And the discipline that is required um, to say, okay, this isn't a core piece. It's a shiny new toy or something else and actually support an agency with doing the maintenance that it should, it's, it's hard because there are forces of political and popularity forces against it, but it really matters in the long run. And if we can flip that switch, if the administration, um, if, if Speaker Adams and, and Mayor Adams can focus on these things, we actually help our cost structure in the long run. On the capital side, we need better transparency into our capital program, into our assets and we do need to comprehensively plan and focus on state of good repair and modernization better than we do um and and i think this is important transparency is one aspect but it's also the discipline of especially the executive on on doing this um to do it i will say there is a proposal to increase the city's debt cap um which we think is premature, but I think as part of that discussion, what's really important, because there might be some needs for investment and more capital, is reforming our capital planning and execution process so it is focusing on the right things and efficient. When we do that, then we'll see what we really need. Thanks, Andy. Um, Okay, so with that, um, we've 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 hit the hour mark, and so I would like to um, I'd like to thank uh, our, our our panelists. Um, before we go, Martha, did you wanna did you wanna make any comments on the poll that you uh, that you that you you gave to the audience? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, just real quickly, um, I'm not sure if you can actually see um, the results, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, uh, uh, people, um, I guess I would say 36% um, uh, agree that um, uh, the property taxes that they pay um, are fair. 26%, um, uh, that's because George Sweeting is um, here. So he, he, he thinks his taxes are fair. 26% um, um, uh, disagree. And 38%, I think this is an important number, say I do not pay property taxes. Very interesting because um, tenants, um, if you're a renter, tenants through your rent, you are actually paying property taxes. And so we need to talk a little bit about that um, on some level. Um, uh, I understand how my property taxes are um, calculated. 64% disagree with that statement, not surprising. 36% um, agree. And again, um, it's probably because um, um, Anna um, is also on, um, on here. Here, um, on some level. Um, and then when my property taxes go up, um, I have no idea who is responsible. 45% say that. 24% um, say it's the city council. 24% um, say it's the city um, assessors who just want to raise revenue for the city. And 7% um, uh, actually say it's my neighbor who paid too much for their house. Um, um, and then um, I, I do love this um, response. And I think it's um, encouraging in terms of thinking about property taxes sort of generally. I want to pay my fair share of property taxes, 86% actually agree with that, 5% um, disagree, and then 17% says there's no way I can be convinced that property taxes are fair. Um, so just really kind of little interesting survey there um, that tells us about some of the challenges in actually um, um, fixing the property tax. So just wanted to say that. Thank you.
Great, thank you. So thank you all for attending. Um, we will be having more of these uh, panels over, over time. Hopefully we can focus again on budget and economic issues. Um, everyone have a good, uh, enjoy the warm weather if you're in New York. And uh, we hope to see you at future uh, events. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone.